Dr. Phil Harris Jones is a specialist radiologist. He's talking today on aging, which, as I can see by the number of you here, is of interest to everybody in this room. Please give Dr. Phil Harris Jones a round of applause, and I'm sure he'll interest us greatly. Thank you very much. It's an interesting subject for me, challenging subject. If you've come to hear the cure, the remedy, I haven't got it. And I was sitting, a couple of people spoke to me before as I was preparing this and said, you know, I'm really having trouble with this aging story. When I look in the mirror, who I see is not who I feel I am. So I was sitting there yesterday in the rain and in the dock, courtesy of Esther, and I wrote my first poem. And I'm going to subject you, my captive audience, to my first poem. And it's called, I Looked in the Mirror. I looked into the mirror, a mistake, and that's for sure. I saw wrinkles upon wrinkles, and many, many more. A man was looking back at me, he was bolder than a coop, with hairs a sprouting from his nose and from his ears to boot. He didn't look too happy, like he'd suddenly been surprised. But despite his sad appearance, there was a twinkle in his eyes. Or maybe it was a tiny tear, because he'd realized the truth. He'd gotten old, so very old, he'd said goodbye to youth. His eyelids were drooping. He had a few more chins. The bags beneath his eyeballs, they were big enough for twins. His six pack was now history. His paunch was in its place. He'd go to gym. He'd go and get thin if he could only find the dawn place. <laughs> his arches they had fallen, a novel on his knee. His back was sore. His eyes were poor and it was difficult to pee. <laughs> his varicose veins had got bigger. They never used to be. His muscles were smaller. He wasn't much taller, and he longed for what he used to be. So what has now happened, he did wonder aloud. The old age has got me, but I'm still very proud. I listened to a lecture that made everything clear, and I hope that I can remember the things that I hold dear. And I know now what's happened. I know how, when, and why. The man that's in the mirror is much older still than I. So I found this course on the internet from the website called Future Learn, and a lot of the lectures I've given have been from that or related to it. And there was a course on aging, and there's an organization now in, at the University of Groningen. It's the European Research Institute of Biology of Aging. Started in 2013, and they look into all forms of aging at a molecular and cellular level. So I've summarized my understanding, such as this, of the course I went on. So there are many definitions of aging, but I've just chosen one. So aging is a process in which random changes um, occur in the structure and function of cellular molecules, leading to organismal failure. The process is intrinsic and extrinsic. So the extrinsic ones we know are smoking, radiation, sunlight radiation. And it is as yet an irreversible process that eventually will lead to death. So I'm just going to go through a few points to share. Since the last century, life expectancy has doubled, and that's due to four things: decreased infant mortality, better nutrition, vaccination, sorry, anti-vaxxers, and antibiotics. And aging is a continuum which starts when we're young, when we're 20. And in the States, it started, I saw an article of 
10 year old children who were starting with hardening of their arteries from, you know, a lifetime of hamburgers up until then. So it can start very young. The oldest person recorded, documented, was 122 years. And aging obviously has a genetic basis where bias with old age running in families. A genetic gene was identified in roundworms in 1983, and it was now identified in humans. The average US male at death is 76 and female 81. Nowadays, we try and talk about health span rather than lifespan. And health span is the length of time an individual is in optimal health. And then when I was in practice, when we were looking at brain scatters, I mean, we would talk about successful and non-successful aging. So somebody with a lot of atrophy of their brain would have unsuccessful aging. There's endless advice on the internet and social media about health staff. Everybody seems to be an expert. There were more than 200 diets I found. There are diets on antioxidants, on increased carbs, decreased carbs, increased fat, decreased fat, fruit diets, fasting diets. All of them work to a certain extent, but they don't work forever. It's like giving us smoking. You get thin, you stop the diet, and you get more fat than you were before. And then there are common but not inevitable age-related diseases such as cardiovascular, cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative. And we'll look just briefly at the end at some of the neurodegenerative ones. So healthy aging is intact cognition in the absence of certain diseases, which we just mentioned. And longevity is polygenic, although to date only a single gene has been discovered in humans. In 2020, Children under 19 outnumbered people over 60. But by 2100, people over 60 will be in the majority. And this obviously has huge consequences for society. And so this is what happens. Now we look at this, how we were the man in the mirror. What happened? So our skin is coarsened. Our pores have become evident. Our hair is coarsened. We've lost the elastic tissue and uh, the collagen, the support tissue in our skin. If we look at a man here, he's got a typical male pattern baldness. But I put this in not to just show the aging process, but to point out that they perhaps didn't get the picture right because as we grow, our noses get bigger. And our ears get bigger. I don't think you've noticed that. Old fellows with these elephant ears. Of course, it doesn't happen to ladies. Now, I thought we'd look at the biblical patriarchs just for fun. Look how we're comparing to them. And we're not doing well, are we? That's the first 10 generations there, and they had the average age of over 900. It's interesting to see that Noah was born when uh, Methuselah was around 400 years old. And the flood occurred when Noah was about 600. Here's Jean Louise Palma, the oldest human recorded. There may have been older people, of course, but just not documented. Now, we've got to go back to cells in order to understand what's coming down the road in this talk. So I keep doing this, and you've seen this slide many times. Just to reiterate that the nuclear material, the chromosomes are held within the nucleus. And there is also genetic material in the mitochondria here. Now, after fertilization, cells form which are basically stem cells. And stem cells or pluripotential cells. They can differentiate into anything, muscle, blood, neurons, gastric lining, bone, whatever you like. They can also replicate themselves. 
And stem cells, as we get older, are still present. So they're not only present in embryological life, they're present in adult life in all of our tissues. So muscle will have muscle stem cells. And a muscle stem cell won't be able to, to produce a bone cell, for instance, or a fat cell. It would produce muscle cells. So a stem cell in fat would produce fat, etc. Uh, but you can reverse that process. And we'll go into that now. So some cells have a, a slower rate of turnover, like muscles and nerves. And some cells turn over very quickly indeed, like skin and intestine and blood cells. Blood cells, red cells only live 120 days. And you can see here other types of cells. So intestinal cells only live two to four days. Whereas eggs, female eggs, live forever. You ladies don't produce more eggs as you get older. You're born with about 400,000 of them and you ripen with each cycle about 40 of them. So you don't get more, whereas us men, we produce millions and millions of sperm. There's no end to our productivity. Now, the nucleus has chromosomes. The chromosomes were named initially by uh, their size. So number one was the biggest, number two, etc. And they were discovered in 1923, but it wasn't until 1954 that they discovered that they got the number of chromosomes wrong. They said to us, from 1923 to 1954, they said the human had 48 chromosomes, 24 pairs. Where it is in reality, a tomato has 24 pairs. We only have 23 pairs. Okay, and 22 of them are called autosomes, and two of them are the sex chromosomes. Now, when we look at DNA, DNA it's made up. It's a big molecule with a double helix formation. There is a backbone of two large, very large sugar molecules, and the rungs of the ladder are made up of four molecules called base pairs. And they're, you don't need to remember their names, but they're guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. So we'll just think of those as G, C, A, and T. The importance being that guanine and cytosine pair up, and adenine and thymine pair up. And you can't mix those combinations. A number of perhaps 10,000 or 20,000, there, there are variations, a number of these base pairs together can form a gene. And a gene is the amount of information that is needed to make proteins. I know this all sounds boring, but it's seriously important because proteins are very plentiful in our bodies. Obviously, muscles are made of protein, cell walls are made of protein. Hormones are protein, enzymes are protein. So all of these sort of the structural and the action molecules of our body are made of protein. And when cells divide and DNA divides, DNA gets replicated by adding A to T and G to C, and that has to be done exactly. And if it isn't done exactly, and mistakes do happen, Normally, the cell will repair the mistake, but sometimes the mistake carries through, and this is called a mutation. Who cares if there's a mutation if we have a T instead of a, a G? Or, well, three of these molecules, nucleotides, give the information to make one amino acid, and many amino acids make a protein. So if you get the information wrong, at the um, nucleotide level, you can get the cell to make a different amino acid, the wrong amino acid. And that makes a different protein, the wrong protein. And that protein may not function properly. And that comes in, as we'll see, with the neurodegenerative changes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. So what can happen? is that as we get older, mutations occur and they accumulate. And the same thing happens with cancer. 
any cancer goes on to get bad mutations. Well, I, I, I suppose an aging mutation you can't call exactly good. So at a molecular and uh, cellular level, there are three types of aging, replicative, chromosomal, and telomere. And I'll just go through those quickly. So replicative is um, uh, when, when we talk about cells at any given time, as you look today, any given time, 10 million of your cells are dividing every second, every second of your life. And normal cells can only divide for a limited number of times. That's called the Hayflick limit. And they think it's about 50 to 70 divisions. And then the cells become old and they can't reproduce efficiently and properly. They lose their function. And we're going to talk about Dolly the sheep in a minute. Now, cells divide at different rates, as we've seen, and they survive for different lengths of time. The more they divide, the more mutations occur. And the more mutations that occur and accumulate, the more problems they are. The mutations are not reversible and they're passed on to the next generation of cells. Uh, accumulated mutations reduce cellular function, leading to senescence. And as we've seen, senescence leads to cell death. And cell death goes on to lead to our death. So, Let's go on and talk about Dolly. Dolly was created from a mammary cell, a breast cell of a fin dorset sheep. So they took a fin dorset sheep cell, they took out the nucleus of that cell, and they put the nucleus in an enucleated cell of a Scottish black mass. And then they gave it an electric jolt and they implanted the zygote that they'd made into another black faced Scottish. And out came five months later Dolly. Dolly had three mothers and no father. And Dolly looked like this one because this is the cell she came from, where, where the nuclear material came from. Now, I put down here that the thought. Flickens because Dolly, when the breast cell was harvested, was six years old. And normally, the fin dorset sheep lived to 12 years old. But Dolly lived to six years old. So we have to wonder if the six year old cell that created Dolly created her premature age. And there's a great debate about that. Here, Dolly, stuffed and presented in the museum. They make clones of Dolly. You can see the family resemblance. And that's Daisy, Debbie, Diana, and Denise. But the thing was that these clones lived a normal 12 year lifespan. So it may be that Dolly's premature demands was not due to her being made from an age itself. Now, then the second type is chromosomal aging. And when the chromosomes duplicate, they require exact duplication of uh, the 46 chromosomes. And that, uh, they are made up of 3 billion with a B base pairs. And mistakes are commonly made, but they're usually repaired. Some mistakes are not repaired, as we see, and mutations can persist. And there are various ways of mistakes forming, and we'll look at that now. And faulty repair can cause genomic instability and lead to accelerated aging, as in progeria, as an example of that. And mistakes cannot be reversed. So here is a child with progeria. I don't know this child's age, but he could be uh, 10, 12. He's likely only to live to 15, but uh, though some have lived, lived a bit longer. And the, the defect is a single mutation in a single gene, that's called this. And it causes instability of the wall of the nucleus of the cell. It's a dominant gene. So if this child had lived to a reproductive age, he could pass on progeria, but uh, they don't. So chromosomes, we've looked at and here they are again. 
And this is an example of a replication error. Down here, you can see there are three. There should be two of each chromosome. Here, there are three. This is trisomy 21, it's called, which is mongolism. So this is the different ways mutations can occur. The point mutations we've seen. You can get insertions when, when the chromosomes replicate, you get bits being inserted or bits being deleted. Or you can get scrambled eggs down at the bottom. And then the third way of aging is telomere attrition. And I think you may have heard of telomeres. It was a popular thing to talk about a few decades ago. And it became sort of the fountain of youth. And a lot of people who were very rich started giving them themselves an enzyme called telomerase. And as we age, the telomeres, which are protective little caps at the end of chromosomes, get smaller with every replication. And they preserve DNA against degradation. And the idea was to give telomerase to prevent this happening. The only problem was that telomerase is found in multiple cancer cells. And what they did eventually, these people who were looking for uh, eternal youth, they gave themselves cancer. Not so clever. So the telomeres are made up of repeated non-coding, meaning they don't make protein sequences. And we've seen these nucleotides before, TTAGG. -G is the human telomere. And we start off with eight to 13,000 telomere-based pairs, and by the time we're uh, getting older, we're down to 1,500. And with each cell division, they decrease in length, so that we lose 20 to 40 based pairs per year. So this is what a telomere would look like if you sequenced it, just a whole bunch of repeats of PTA, GGT. And as the cell replicates, so the telomere at the end gets shorter. And it's like, it's just like an aglet on a shoelace. That's how you can think of it. So when it gets shorter, 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 down to its depletion, total depletion, then the chromosome starts unraveling. Now there's another cell we've got to look at. We just mentioned it, and that's the stem cell. And they say that if stem cells age, then everything ages. Stem cells were thought to be immortal, but they're not. We know now they're not. The only thing that's immortal is cancer cells, untreated cancer cells. They, they go on forever. So if we take a stem cell, we've seen that they can replicate themselves and they can differentiate. And they can get damaged in much the same, same way as somatic cells, that's all other cells that they've differentiated to. And function of the cell declines as they multiply, their, their function declines. Now, I've got a little movie here which will explain everything much better than me. In the early embryo, very soon after fertilization, there are stem cells that are able to differentiate or mature into any other tissue in our body. These cells are therefore called pluripotent stem cells. But very quickly thereafter, they become specialized. They can only contribute to the tissue in which they live. These are tissue-specific stem cells. So stem cells in the brain only produce new brain cells and those in the gut produce gut cells. Almost all our organs contain a small population of these tissue-specific stem cells. In every tissue, many cells die when they reach their normal lifespan or after injury. In some tissues, the lifespan of cells is very long. Cells in the heart, skeletal muscle, brain, and the lens in your eye all live very long. In contrast, in other tissues, the lifespan of cells is very short, such as skin, gut, and blood. In fact, every week, the inner lining of your gut is renewed. 
and every month your skin is replaced completely. This is possible by tissue-specific stem cells, which continuously replace cells that have become lost. One could argue that tissue stem cells are nature's own anti-aging agents. Without these stem cells, many tissues would age prematurely, as no repair could ever happen. However, whereas skin wounds recover very quickly in young infants, as we grow older, healing gets more difficult. Many old people suffer from too few blood cells and become susceptible to infections or anemic. It seems very plausible that at least some aspects of reduced tissue functioning during aging results from a reduced functioning of stem cells. How could stem cells age? As stem cells divide very often during the lifetime of an organism, they need to replicate their DNA and pass this on to their two daughter cells. Damaged DNA is therefore bad for stem cells. Patients that suffer from diseases that result in increased levels of DNA damage typically have problems with regenerating tissues and age prematurely. A special case of DNA damage relates to the ends of chromosomes, also referred to as telomeres. These ends shorten a little bit with every cell division. If the ends become too short, a stem cell cannot properly divide any longer. There may be multiple other reasons why stem cells perform worse with age. One of these appears to relate to the process of epigenetics. Epigenetics refers to the program that dictates which specific components of the DNA are used by a cell. For example, the hemoglobin gene is present in all cells of our body, but it is only used by red blood cells. Similarly, the insulin gene is only used by cells in the pancreas. DNA in a cell is typically very compact, and compact DNA cannot be used. If a cell needs to use a stretch of DNA, for example to produce hemoglobin or insulin, this part of the DNA needs to open up so that it becomes accessible. Epigenetic enzymes take care of this and locally open up or close stretches of DNA. Epigenic regulation can be compared with the instructions that a software program uses to select which components it needs at a specific time point to execute a certain function. It has become clear that these epigenic instructions are very important for stem cells and for unclear reasons change with age. This may result in some information becoming inaccessible in aged cells. At present, we do not know how to delay aging but if we would be able to find ways to keep stem cells functioning properly during aging, tissues would remain more healthy. So, when we look at the diseases of elderly, cardiovascular, obviously that strokes, heart attack, hypertension, which many of us have already, diabetes, you don't necessarily have to be overweight to have diabetes. Tim Noakes is an example of that. You wouldn't mind me telling you. Uh, he's got a familial type. I mean, he's skinny and he's got diabetes. And that's why he got on to diet as the cure for, for his diabetes. Osteoporosis is common in all of us. And even men, although we only hear of it in, in women, and then cancer, half of us are going to get cancer. And then the neurodegenerative diseases, and a lot of us are going to get those too. Neurodegenerative disease is the, occurs because the cells are unable to get rid of abnormal accumulated proteins. Okay, so as I explained, you, you get a mutation, you get an abnormal amino acid produces an abnormal protein. The abnormal proteins can accumulate in various places. Uh, in the case we're using here, it's in the brain, and they can accumulate inside the nerve cell or outside. Whichever, they can affect the function of the nerve cell, and we get these diseases. Now, the first one I'm just going to talk about is Huntington's disease or Huntington's career. Not a nice condition at all. Uh, just to show you that these diseases tend to occur in different parts of the brain. 
so that Huntington's disease is at the bottom, much like Parkinson's in the basal ganglia, they call it. And Alzheimer's it tends to be a disease of the cortex of the brain. So Huntington's disease is a disease of movement, cognition, and behavior. It's a dominant gene, and the problem with it is it only presents at age 30 or 50. Age 30 or 50, most of us have started reproducing, and it leads to brain atrophy and death always within 20 years of inception. So you've given the disease to your kids before you know you have it. That's the problem. And it's due to intracellular protein aggregation. It's a dominant gene, and this would be a typical family tree for a dominant gene where the red denotes activity either in male, which is the square, and female, uh, the round. But it's in every generation, and it affects roughly 50% of the offspring. And that's what a, a dominant gene does. It's due to, here we go back again to our amino acids, in, in the HTT gene, uh, which we all have, there are a number of repeats of a particular sequence of amino acids. And that is normal if you only have 10 to 26 repeats. But in Huntington's, they have many, many more. It gives an abnormal protein, the protein accumulates, the cells don't work properly. Similar thing happens in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's often has a tremor, not always has slow movements and gait problems. Uh, Parkinson's people have difficulty initiating walking. So they stand there, and uh, I had a stepfather with it, and he used to just stand there. And I said, come on, go, let's go. And he said, I just have to wait to take this first step. And once he took it, he was off like a rocket. But that first step was the problem. They have rigid limbs they used to Tell us at medical school if you've got a patient with Parkinson's arm, it felt like bending a lead pipe, which is called lead pipe rigidity. They obviously have impaired posture and gait, they go forward and, and they have diminished facial expression. You have somebody with Parkinson's, they're not smiling at your jokes, they can't. A lot of them will get dementia, and they get a form of dementia called Lewy body dementia. And Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's are a spectrum of the same condition. So if you start with Lewy body dementia, you will often go on to get Parkinson's and vice versa. Again, due to deposition of abnormal proteins. And in Parkinson's case, they get rid of an important neurotransmitter called dopamine. Now here's the typical appearance of shuffling gait and they have uh, what's called a pill rolling tremor. So unlike my tremor, which is fast frequency tremor, for, it's a benign essential tremor. There's it's like that. There are many different kinds. Mine doesn't lead to brain uh, problems, I hope, although my wife didn't lead. So here we have Louis bodies. This is abnormal proteins accumulating in the cells. The problem, of course, is the real diagnosis, the pathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, needs a biopsy. So none of us are going to go to a neurosurgeon and say, here, have a piece of my brain, so that they can look under the microscope to find these things. So normally, the definitive diagnosis is made post-mortem. Alzheimer's disease is a young familial form when I was in medical school, Alzheimer's was called pre-senile dementia. It wasn't this grab bag of anybody who's got dementia has got Alzheimer's. So it was pre-senile, it was below 60 years of age or even younger. Nowadays, it's the reverse. It's more than 60 years of age and it's common. 12 to 20% of people over 85. And it's said it's said that those numbers are going to double by 2050. 
It only affects humans. The protein aggregates outside the nerve cell. And the protein you probably heard of is called beta amyloid. And there are other proteins called tau tangles. There is an, an amyloid tipping point. So you accumulate, 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 and the, the last straw that breaks the camel back, then you start getting symptoms. And amyloid deposits start 20 years before the symptoms come on. If you have deposits of amyloid, lots of them, not everybody gets Alzheimer's. There are people who are resistant to this. Stuff. There's a blood test which is coming up now. I think it's present in America to tell how much amyloid you have in your bloodstream or in your CSF. You'd have a lot of puncture and get out cerebrospinal fluid. There is a scan, a PET a CT scan for that positron emission tomography. This is a radionuclide form of CT scan and it can give a quantitative amount of clock. The boundary between normal age-related decline and early Alzheimer's is blurred. So when we worry about losing our coffees and uh, why did I go into the room, what am I doing here? That can be normal, but it is normal. But it's a matter of degree. It's a matter of it affects your lifestyle that you can get worried about uh, dementia. They're working on vaccinations for Alzheimer's now, so that antibodies are formed, which will gobble up the amyloid. And interestingly, if not unbelievably, they're using Viagra now as a treatment. So here's what happens at a cellular level. They get protein deposition both inside and outside of the cell. And Alzheimer's, there is a gradual, steady, loss of brain tissue, you can see how atrophied this brain is compared to that one. I just put this here, there's too much information, but there are other forms of dementia, obviously. Vascular dementia is not uncommon, and that's due to us having multiple small strokes, which either come from the heart when we get atrial fibrillation, form clots in your heart, they go upstairs, I don't know what's happening to the sound of them. Atrial fibrillation can form clots in your heart and they can circulate in your body. Go upstairs, cause micro strokes, vascular dementia. Lewy body dementia I've mentioned, they tend to have hallucinations, Lewy body dementia typically. And the, the dementia runs a fluctuating course, whereas Alzheimer's is a steady decline. Now, what are we going to do about aging? And so, the things that work, besides these 200 different diets that work, but anyway, the things that really work are calorie restriction. So they say, you know, get your plate of food and take 20% away and eats what's left. I tend to put 20% more extra on up there. The lower age groups below 50 should have less protein and increased carbs and vice versa in over 65. We should all eat lots of vegetables. We should exercise. I read two days ago that uh, 6,000 steps a day is required. There are step meters you can put in your pocket. We should do mental stimulation. You're doing the right thing by being here. You should play bridge, paint, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, music, play an instrument or listen, learn a language. These are the things that are going to protect your brain and create additional circuits so that if we have an incident, we get atrophy of the brain, we've got excess brain power to help us along. So the bad bits are going to take longer to arrive. And then social engagement and inclusivity, again, as we're doing here, very important. Own a dog. Owning a cat doesn't help. The rapport with dogs, uh, as we all know, is wonderful. Now, what's the promise? Well, we get uh, increased health span. So the lion, we stay healthy, 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 and then we get our disease and die. Whereas the slippery slope from earlier on 
of what we're trying to avoid. So we tried to delay the age-related diseases. And with that, you should extend uh, lifespan. So we've got to stay away from these. We've got to stick to these. And with this in mind, on Saturday morning at the Hermanus track, across the road, there will be a meeting. Now, I've just got one more video because there's something exciting on the horizon for us all, and I have to share it with you. So, do you feel better about it or worse? <laughs> Any question? So the question is, what, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And the answer is that Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. So there are many types. There's Alzheimer's dementia, there's Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body dementia, there's frontotemporal temporal dementia, there's vascular dementia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the symptoms, eventually are going to be much the same because bits of your brain are going to get picked off depending where where the focus of abnormality is. And so Alzheimer's tends to get memory, cortical function, uh, vascular, can get anywhere, can do anything. I've got a friend the other day who was in the hospital, suddenly woke up with a thumb that didn't work. Okay, And the MR showed a little white spot on the exactly where her thumb was represented. In her brain here. They tend to have clusters of, of symptoms so that the Lewy body tends to have hallucinations and tends to lead an undulating course, whereas Alzheimer's doesn't. It's the gradual decline. It's one of the different types of dementia. That's the question is, can the plaques and proteins that get deposited in the brain be reversed? And the answer is there's that vaccine that they're trying. Um, there are drugs. Remember, the deposition of amyloid starts 20 years before we get symptoms. So if you can find three or four years down the line that this is going to happen to you, the idea is to stop the deposition. To, uh, and they're working on drugs. John is all I can tell you. I don't, I don't know that they're available, but they will be. They will be, because so many people are going to have this problem. 15% of the population, eh? that's big stuff. And it's, we're living older, you know, so, so we, these diseases are developing. You didn't get Alzheimer's 100 years ago, or if you did, it was only in the familial form, the pre-senile dementia. So the question is, is there an alcohol form of dementia? Now, there must be, John, alcohol. They say, you know, you read such different things. I mean, um, it's ridiculous. The, the medical literature is absurd. You know, when, when I was younger, sugar was supposed to cause heart attacks. But if you look at the African population, they eat two pounds of it a, a day. You know, and Then there was butter. You must have butter. You must only have margarine. Now you, you must not have margarine. You must only have butter. But what I read about alcohol was, firstly, the accepted knowledge on alcohol is that you're allowed to have one or two units per day. Okay, that would be one, uh, one or two beers or a dragon. My child makes dragon ginger beer. This is not an advert. Dragon alcoholic ginger beer. One or two units a day is fine. You are going to lose brain cells. 
where do they get that from? I mean, they're not taking out brains to look at them every day and biopsying them. I don't know where that comes from. But this is in reputable journals. That's what they say. Am I going to stop drinking? No way. So the question is, is there a relationship between smoking and dementia? I don't know uh, that there is. You know, when I was smoking, I did it to stimulate my brain which I did for a while until I needed the next cigarette to say in the dip. Smoking causes increased hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis causes hypertension, strokes, heart attack. So vascular dementia as a consequence of smoking makes sense in the bigger picture. Antioxidants, supposed to remove some of these proteins that have collected that are not good for us. Is that the idea behind antioxidant diets? You know, I, I really can't answer that for perhaps nutritionists to answer. That's out of the realms of standard medicine that I read about. But, so I don't know, I, I can't tell you. Uh, you'll read lots about that on Google. You'll find 10 million articles on antioxidants and increasing your age and I'm not going to ask the question, I'm going to say so. So it's kind of difficult to say two glasses of wine a day are definitely uh, good and four, three glasses is not good. Or four. It's, I think it's probably more important if you drink your wine is to drink it slowly, whether it's a beer or whether it's wine. It's just sip it slowly, stop gulping and stuff down. I think that, that is the worst thing you can do, is to down your drinks excessively uh, quickly. But nobody really knows whether it's two glasses or whether it's four. Or if you have two at lunchtime, two in the evening, that's four and you've gone over the limit. It really is also sipping wine with your food and sipping it slowly. And then with diet, it's, there's no doubt that the best diet is a well-balanced Mediterranean diet. And all the fad diets, including the Noakes diet, is an unbalanced diet. And us in the medical field generally believe in a well-balanced Mediterranean diet, not the fad, high fat, sorry, uh, no. We don't, we don't go along. I also want to emphasize the, the exercise side of things, as with aging. Now, exercise as a remedy to assist with, uh, with aging is very important. But it depends. The exercise you've got to think is it aerobic. In other words, am I doing cardiovascular exercise like walking or jogging or any activity around the home, gardening, aerobic exercises for the heart and lung, very important. Then you get to the strength, and you know, we lose muscle mass every year as we age. So strengthening muscle physically, even getting a couple of 3 kg weights for older people, putting and doing muscle strengthening exercises to limits the muscle mass loss that you get with age. Because with that comes instability of gait, of joint support, falls, hip fractures, etc., etc. Osteoporosis is improved by strength. So you've got to have strength training. Then you need, you need flexibility and stretch because with age you stiffen up and your muscles need that stretching as well as resistance or strength. And then the last thing about exercise is balance. Without balance, you can't function properly. You're going to stumble, you're going to walk badly, you're going to handle steps badly. So exercise as we age is probably more important than any medication that any doctor can prescribe. About, uh, uh, and look at the exercise in those of those. I need strength, balance, flexibility, and also uh, strength. And don't forget, get yourself some weights. 
and do resistance training because you're losing muscle mass every year. Right. You can get muscle back. Yes, you can. You can. It's more difficult. Here, the older we get, exercise becomes more difficult, doesn't it? It's an effort. But from very early on, you know, I remember when I was 10, man, I could go forever. And then I had puberty, and suddenly it was like I had lead weights in my pockets. I had to train. And it's only gone downhill from there. But you can get the muscle bulk back. You lose, as you've just been told, or in my poem, you lose muscle every year, quite, quite a big percentage, and it has consequences.